So a few weeks ago, I did a video on the famous Pentium Overdrive chip for 486 systems, really unique processor that Intel developed to breathe some life into the aging 486 platforms out there. The video turned out to be a lot more popular than I expected, and I got some really interesting historical context from folks who actually bought the Overdrive back in the mid 90s. Although no one really disputes that it was a great performing chip, it seems that it was actually pretty hard to get and many people wound up paying a lot more than the advertised $300 MSRP for it. And although I may have painted it in a very positive light in my last video, you'll see today that all things considered, it may not have been the best choice for everyone, and it was certainly not the only choice when it came to pushing the 486 platform to its limits. One of the questions that kept coming up in the comments was how it compared to other upgrade chips from AMD and Cyrix that were available at the time. Not only were these other chips easily obtainable, they were also much more affordable than the Pentium Overdrive. So today I'll be pitting the Pentium Overdrive up against two very formidable competitors, the AMD AM5X86 and the Cyrix 5X86. And not only am I going to put these chips through their paces, I'm also going to push them to their limits. That's right, I'm going to overclock all three and do some tweaking to see how far we can really take the 486 platform. So stay tuned, the results may actually surprise you. So before I begin, I just wanted to take a moment and give a shout out and a very big thank you to Lee from Nova Scotia in Canada. Lee made a very generous channel donation recently and sent me a big box full of retro PC parts, including several CPUs, some motherboards, memory, and more. Included in the box was an 83 megahertz Pentium Overdrive and a evergreen upgrade processor as well. Both of these chips will be featured in this video today and I'm sure you'll be seeing more of his parts in some future videos too. So thanks again, Lee. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the Pentium Overdrive for this video because I did discuss it quite a bit in my last one. I'll put a uh, link to that video in the description if you'd like to learn more. But basically the pod, as it's often called, is a modified Pentium that has a unique 32-bit external data bus which allows it to work with the older and slower 486 platforms. The slower bus did limit performance a bit compared to a similarly clocked Pentium, but the pod still had a true Pentium core with all of those wonderful architectural improvements. One of the biggest being its superscalar design that allowed it to run two instructions simultaneously. The Pentium was really the first x86 chip to do this and was much faster clock for clock than the 486 because of it. Thanks to the pipelining and an improved FPU, the Pentium was also vastly superior to the 486 when it came to doing float point math, something becoming more important as software and operating systems evolved in the mid 90s. The bus speed limitation was unfortunate, but Intel did something very interesting to help offset this. They actually doubled the Pentium's L1 cache to a whopping 32 kilobytes, something that no other Intel chip had at the time and wouldn't again until the MMX processors were released in 97. But I don't think everything went quite according to plan for Intel with the pod. Getting a chip like the Pentium to work with an old 486 platform is not an easy feat. I can't say for sure, but I expect there were probably some yield issues, power limitations, and other complicating factors that meant the clock speeds ended up being pretty low, really. Intel was also delayed getting the faster 83 megahertz model out the door. I think it was almost seven months after the 63 megahertz model was released earlier in 1995, so it was quite a delay. So thanks to Lee's generous channel donation, I now have two Pentium Overdrive chips for 486 systems here. I must say it is really great to finally have one with the special OEM cooling system still intact. And again, check out my last video to find out why my first chip here has this monstrosity of a cooler on it and to find out more about the pod's very unique cooling system. So when it comes to overclocking with the pod, I wish I could say there was all kinds of extra headroom on tap and you could really get a lot more performance out of it. But sadly, these are generally pretty poor overclockers. So even though Pentiums were available up to 133 megahertz back in 1995, Intel went with pretty low and strange clock speeds, 83 and 63 megahertz instead of a nice round, you know, 75 or 100. And that seems to support the theory that, you know, they did have some challenges with these chips. But increasing the front side bus from 33 to 40 megahertz does give you a nice 100 megahertz total clock, but sadly the majority of pods out there just can't handle 100 megahertz. My modified CPU here will boot at 100 while the chip is cool and I can sometimes get through a quick benchmark or two, but sadly the system is just very unstable. I can't run Doom for more than a few seconds before it crashes and you can totally forget Quake. Once the chip's had a chance to warm up, it's, it's even worse and it's game over. And yeah, sadly, this is just very representative of what most pod owners experienced when it came to overclocking. But uh, what about increasing voltage? 
As you'll recall, the pod doesn't use the mother motherboard for power regulation and instead regulates 5 volts from the socket down to the 3.45 volts with its onboard regulator. So there really aren't any options on the chip to change this, but there are certainly ways to modify or bypass the regulator to get more juice into the core. I've heard that, you know, with about 3.8 to 4 volts, it is possible to do 100 megahertz, but really that's a topic for another day and another video. But after I said all of that, I am incredibly lucky here because Lee's overdrive chip just so happens to be totally stable at 100 megahertz. I spent a lot of time testing it and it really does seem perfectly stable. So even though this isn't really terribly realistic for the majority of people out there with pods, I'm still gonna be including the overclock benchmark results just for good measure. But anyway, I think that's enough about the pod. Let's take a look at some of the competition. So next up is AMD's famous AM5X86 P75 released in December of 95, not long after the 83 MHz Pentium Overdrive. Despite its name suggesting that it's a next generation 586 like the Pentium, this really couldn't be further from the truth. The AM5X86 is a 486 through and through and really brings no architectural improvements to the table, but that doesn't mean it isn't a fast chip. On the contrary, it was the fastest 486 ever released. Intel didn't really continue development of the 46 or release any new models after the DX4100 and understandably focused their efforts on the Pentium instead. But AMD's next generation K5 was still a ways out yet, so they kept pushing the 486 platform and they were able to benefit from manufacturing improvements, giving them higher and higher clock speeds. First with the 120MHz DX4 and then ultimately with the 133MHz AM5x86. This was the first 486 chip to ever take advantage of a 4x multiplier, and since that was one step up from a DX4, it was often nicknamed the DX5. And although a 486 really can't compete with a Pentium clock for clock, it doesn't really need to if it's clocked high enough. And with an introductory price of only $93, it became a very compelling upgrade option, especially if you compare it to the very expensive Pentium Overdrive. So as you can see, I've got quite a few AM5X86s here. I actually bought a bunch of them recently in my search for a top tier overclocker. And even today, they're actually pretty easy to find and really not all that expensive. As you can see, it's just a normal 168 pin PGA chip, just like any other old 486 out there. But unlike older 486s, it's really got the best that the platform has to offer, including 16 kilobytes of L1 cache and write-back L1 cache support too. Not all chipsets and boards can support write-back L1, so that's uh, something you'd have to see if you, if you can actually take advantage of, but it can provide a nice uh, boost in performance in some situations. When it comes to upgrading though, there are pros and cons. On one hand, the AM5x86 can work in just about any board that supports a DX2 or a DX4. But on the other hand, it's a 3.45 volt CPU and can't run on older boards that only support 5 volts to the socket, which are actually quite a few of the older systems out there. There are socket interposers that can be used to get around this, but in most cases, people looking to upgrade would not really be considering you know, a regular AM5x86 chip like this one. Instead, they'd look for third-party quote-unquote upgrade chips like the Kingston Turbo chip or this one here from Evergreen Technologies. So as you can see, the chip has a voltage regulator here and other passive components on the surface to convert the five volts supplied by the socket down to the 3.45 required by the CPU. Very similar really to what Intel does with the pod and their DX4100 overdrive as well. And uh, you'll notice that Evergreen actually includes some jumpers on the surface here as well for changing the multiplier between three and four X and even changing the caching mode too which actually makes the chip really useful for older boards that may not have these configuration jumpers available. These retail box upgrade chips like this were typically more expensive than the normal AM5x86s, but they were still much more affordable than the Pentium Overdrive. So when it comes to overclocking, you'd think that the already high 133 MHz clock would mean that there really isn't much headroom left in the chip, but that isn't true at all. The AM5x86 is actually a legendary overclocker. And to be honest, I've never seen a chip that couldn't do 160 megahertz at its default voltage. The, the yields really are that good. Most chips have a really hard time going beyond that though, and achieving 180 or 200 megahertz is really not a simple feat. But that said, the 50 megahertz bus speed and the lower 3x multiplier allows for some very interesting results. Even though the clock speed is slightly lower at 150 megahertz, the fast bus really unleashes the platform and increases the memory and L2 cache performance quite a bit. It'd be interesting to see what provides more benefit, 3x50 or 4x40.
I should mention that achieving a 50 megahertz bus speed on a 46 isn't always easy, and I don't think it's something the average consumer could or would do back in 1995. Some tweaking and tuning is sometimes necessary, and it requires fast memory, fast L2 cache, and expansion cards that can handle it in some cases. Even though it may not be realistic for 24-7 use, I'm going to do it anyway, you know, for science and stuff. And last but not least is the Cyrix 5x86. So unlike the AM 5x86, this chip is indeed a next generation design and quite a unique processor in many respects. Released in the summer of 1995, it was actually based on Cyrix's M1 core that was being developed for their 6x86 processor that was eventually released in early 96. Since the M1 was designed to work on socket 7 systems like the Pentium, it uh, also had to be adapted to work on a slower 32-bit external data bus. But unlike the Pod, which was a full-blown Pentium core, the 5x86 was scaled back quite a bit with a much lower transistor count, likely to keep costs and power consumption down, I think. So the chip I have here is the 100 megahertz model with a 33 megahertz front side bus and a three times multiplier. There is also a 120 megahertz model out there designed for 40 megahertz buses, but it's a little bit harder to find. And I should mention for historical correctness that there is a 133 megahertz model available with a four times multiplier. It was produced, but it was extremely rare and practically vaporware really. I don't think the yields were really good enough for it to be produced in any meaningful quantity out there. My chip here has Cyrix branding, which may sound kind of funny being a Cyrix chip, but because Cyrix didn't actually manufacture these, they made deals with IBM and ST, who also released their versions of the chip too. IBM's version of this chip had a very characteristic blue heatsink and a slightly different name too, the 5x86C. When it comes to cost, this chip was about $150, $160 when it was first released, but from what I can see, prices did go down a fair bit after that. Another interesting thing about the Cyrix 5x86 is that there were numerous next-gen features in the chip that ended up being disabled before it hit the market. Things like branch prediction, load store reordering, and even some FPU-related tweaks. It's not clear exactly why Cyrix decided to turn them off by default. Maybe they weren't quite ready for prime time but I imagine it was partly to improve compatibility across a wide range of chipsets. What's really interesting though is that these disabled features can actually be turned back on through the use of software registers. Whether or not your particular system would be stable enough would have to be seen, but they can provide a very significant performance boost, sometimes as high as 20%. This really could be a topic for a video in and of itself, so I'm not gonna get too much into this, but if you'd like to learn more about these register enhancements, there's a fantastic Vogons thread on the subject that I'll link to in the description. Not all of the disabled features could be turned back on in my case, but I was able to enable a few, including FP fast mode, branch prediction, and a few others. It took a little bit of trial and error and some lengthy stability testing to be sure, but I think I found the optimal configuration for my particular platform here, and I'll definitely be including benchmark results with these features enabled and disabled. The Cyrix 5x86 is actually a pretty decent overclocker, at least the 100 MHz model is. Most chips will do 120 with a 40 MHz bus without difficulty, but anything beyond that is actually much harder to achieve. If you're lucky enough to have the blue IBM version of this chip, there are rumors that they were binned a little more conservatively and will have more overclocking headroom than the Cyrix branded ones like this one here. So my chip here is perfectly happy to run all day long at 120 megahertz and the default 3.45 volts, but when I enable the extra features, I noticed it's ever so slightly unstable. It does crash occasionally under heavy load, so I just had to give it a very slight boost to 3.6 volts, and that resolved it completely, and it's really solid as a rock now. So like the AM5x86, the Cyrix chip also allows a lower multiplier to be set. I can reduce it from 3 to 2, and boost the front side bus up to 50 megahertz. This still gives me the default 100 megahertz clock speed, unfortunately, so it's not technically an overclock, but it does really unleash the platform with better memory cache and PCI bus performance. So be interesting to see how it does in that situation as well. So for testing, I'm gonna use my Shuttle Hot 433 Revision 4.0 board. It's a very late UMC-based 486 board, so it may not be the best representation of the average upgrade somebody would have done back in 1995, but it is a board I know supports all of these chips and can take advantage of all their features for best performance, including things like write-back L1 cache and some of the hidden features of the Cyrix 5x86 as well. So I'm using a Matrox Millennium 2 PCI card for VGA duties, and although there are some slightly better performing PCI cards out there, 
I'm using this one because it's one of the few that I have that'll run happily at a 50 megahertz bus frequency. So the board does have 256K of L2 cache in it, and I've got a single stick of 16 meg, uh, 60 nanosecond EDO RAM. I should mention that I have everything running at zero weight states and the tightest cache timings possible for my testing at 33 and 40 megahertz bus speeds. To get 50 megahertz running stable, I do have to loosen the cache timings very slightly to 222 instead of 212, but that's it really, everything else is the same. So the pod has an integrated OEM heatsink and fan, but for the ceramic top AMD and Cyrix chips, I just place a uh, small 50 millimeter heatsink on top, and I've just got a 92 millimeter fan here that I just keep next to the board, and really that's plenty to keep the uh, the CPU cool. There's a regulator here as well on the board, voltage regulator, so the fan does help to keep that part cool as well. And so without further ado, let's uh, see how these chips perform. So let's start with some synthetic CPU benchmarks, and first up is SpeedSys. This benchmark is a bit more modern than some of the others out there for DOS, and it does make use of the CPU's float point unit to some degree. In this test here, we can see the Pentium Overdrive comes out on top by a pretty healthy margin. The AM5x86 and Cyrix5x86 aren't all that far behind here, but what's most surprising is the huge boost we see on the Cyrix chip by enabling some of its features. From 45.9 all the way up to 55.2 for an increase of over 20%. But at whatever angle you look at this chart, it's pretty clear that all three CPUs have a lot more number crunching power than your average DX2 or DX4. When we include the overclocked results here, we can see pretty much the same pattern. The pod manages a really nice improvement with a top score of 74. But again, it's important to remember that most pod chips won't be able to achieve this overclock. The Cyrix 5x86 really comes out of its shell at 120 megahertz here, and it can even surpass the stock clocked pod, but only if its features are enabled. The AM5x86 also makes a very impressive showing at 160 MHz and almost catches up to the pod despite its architectural limitations. You'll notice that the 40 and 50 MHz bus speeds here really don't help at all in the synthetic benchmark, and that's because L2 cache, memory, and VGA performance don't really play too much of a role here. It's really just pure CPU number crunching ability. So next up is the System Information CPU benchmark. This one here is a bit older and it seems to have a lot more emphasis on integer math performance. This time we can see that the really high clock speed of the AM5x86 is putting it right on top with a score of 288. Interestingly, the pod and the Cyrix chip actually score identically in this benchmark. I went back a couple of times to test again just to make sure I didn't make a mistake recording the numbers, but nope, it really is 263.9 for both. Technically, the pod is faster clock for clock here though at 83 versus 100 megahertz, but still. Another interesting observation is that with this particular benchmark and the math it's doing, the enabled features on the Cyrix chip really have no benefit at all. But again, we're seeing some pretty impressive gains over the traditional 486s here. If we include the overclocked results, we see much more of the same with the AM5x86 still on top with its very high 150 and 160 megahertz clock speeds. And again, the 120 megahertz Cyrix matches the score of the pod at 100 megahertz exactly with a score of 316.8. And what about float point math performance? I'm using the landmark system speed test for this measurement, and not surprisingly, the Pentium Overdrive comes out on top by a huge margin here. The FPU improvements in the Pentium Core, and especially the superscalar architecture, which allows it to run two instructions per clock, just really give it next generation FPU performance here. Nothing else comes even close. But I was really impressed to see the huge FPU performance boost in the Cyrix 5x86 with the extra features enabled. I assume the register called FPU Fast is responsible here, but that's a 25% improvement. The AM 5x86 is lagging behind here a little bit, but that's really expected. But its high clock speed does still allow it to outperform the Cyrix 5x86 without its features enabled. Looking at the overclocked results only further pushes the pod ahead with a score of over 2000, which is just really impressive. But the Cyrix 5x86 also does pretty well here at 120 megahertz and still manages a 200 point increase, taking it to 1444. Not bad at all. Next, let's take a look at some cache and memory bandwidth figures as reported by SpeedSys. The chart could vary a bit depending on how it's sorted, but I decided to sort it based on main memory bandwidth in this case. The Cyrix 5x86 actually comes out on top by a very healthy margin when it comes to both main memory and L2 cache bandwidth. Its L1 bandwidth is also quite good, but it's bested by the Pentium Overdrive. Although the L1 bandwidth is very high, the pod actually has some pretty disappointing L2 and memory bandwidth figures here. Even the DX4 seems to do better. Internally, I think the chip is very fast, but its lower clock speed probably limits its speed in accessing the L2 cache and memory over the 32-bit data bus, if I had to guess. 
Looking at the overclocked results, we can see that the AM5x86 with its spicy 50 MHz bus is way on top for memory bandwidth, and the 120 MHz Cyrix does really well here too, especially with L2 cache. The overclocked pod here does a lot better with L2 and memory thanks to its higher frequency and bus speed as well. One thing I should mention, you'll notice that I didn't include 2 times 50 MHz results for the Cyrix chip here. Speeds has had some difficulty distinguishing between the L2 cache and memory and gave me some weird results, so I had to remove it unfortunately. Next up, let's look at some cache and memory latency figures as reported by the cache check utility. Unlike bandwidth, when it comes to latency, lower is better. And again, this chart could change depending on how it's sorted. I'm sorting based on L1 cache latency here. But basically, we're seeing pretty much the same trend as we did before. The Cyrix 5x86 is way on top with very impressive L1, L2, and main memory latency figures. The AM5x86 is sort of middle of the road here, but really not too far behind the Cyrix. And again, the pod doesn't do particularly well with L2 and main memory latency higher than even the DX4. When we include the overclocked results, the Cyrix chip is still dominating this chart in all five top positions. And as expected, the 40 and 50 MHz bus speed really does help to improve L2 and main memory latency across all of the processors. So let's take a look at 3D Bench 1.0C. Unlike synthetic CPU benchmarks, this one can be greatly affected by cache and memory performance, bus speed, as well as the performance of the video card in the system. It's a much better gauge of the overall system performance, in my opinion. And bottom line here, all three chips do really well and are within a few frames per second of each other. The pod does have a very slight lead over the AM5x86, but really not by much. And the Cyrix 5x86 really isn't far behind here either. In this benchmark, the enabled features do make a small difference, about 4% or so. Not bad. If we include the overclocked results though, things get a lot more interesting. The 40 and 50 MHz bus speeds and the faster cache, memory, and VGA performance really benefit this benchmark. Look at that 150 MHz AM5x86 result. Almost 100 frames per second, and the 160 MHz result really isn't far behind either. We see similar boosts from the other two chips here too with the faster bus speeds. PC Player is another early gaming benchmark, but unlike 3D Bench, can be run at different resolutions. I'm running it here at both 320 x 200 and 640 x 480. The metric here is just a proprietary point system as far as I know, and I don't think it's based on frames per second, so keep that in mind if the numbers look a bit low. There isn't really a drastic difference between the three chips here, but the Cyrix 5x86 is lagging behind quite a bit for some reason. It's even outperformed by the DX4 here. The enabled features do help a bit, but really not much. What I can't figure out though is why on earth the DX4 outperforms the AM5x86 at 320 by 200. I repeated the test several times, but kept getting the same result. Architecturally, they're pretty much the same chips, but with the AM5x86 having a clock advantage, so it doesn't really make much sense to me. But at least when you sort it at 640 by 480, it does make a bit more sense. Again, things get more interesting here with the overclocked results. The faster bus speeds provide a significant boost here with the AM5x86 doing really well, especially at 640 x 480. The Cyrix 5x86 does a little better at 120 megahertz, but still lagging behind quite a bit. And moving on to one of my favorite games, Doom. In this benchmark, the high clock speed of the AM5x86 allows it a healthy lead over the pod. The Pentium's architectural improvements just don't provide enough of a benefit in this game for the lower 83 MHz clock speed to keep up. What's a bit surprising to me though is that the Cyrix chip again lags behind here quite a bit. It's almost 20% slower than the AM5x86. It's even outperformed again here by the DX4100. Enabling the extra features does provide about a 5% boost, but again, I'm still surprised it doesn't do better when you consider its impressive synthetic scores, and especially its superior memory bandwidth and latency. And again, the overclocked AM5x86 pulls off some really impressive numbers here, almost 60 frames per second with the 50 MHz bus speed, and the Pentium Overdrive also does quite a bit better here at 100 MHz, as does the Cyrix 5x86 thanks to the 40 MHz bus. And finally, Quake, which was released in 1996. Quake makes very heavy use of float point math and was really never intended to run on the 486 platform. Not surprisingly, the Pentium Overdrive comes on top here again with a score of 20.2 frames per second. And as I mentioned in my last video, it's not buttery smooth, but at that frame rate, I'd say the game was definitely playable. The high clock speed of the AM5x86 does manage a pretty respectable 14.2 frames per second here, which is pretty incredible for a true 486 core, that's for sure. But sadly, at that frame rate, the game can get very choppy at times and just really isn't all that enjoyable.
The Cyrix chip really didn't do very well here, unfortunately, even though the enabled features give it a 15% performance boost in Quake. Again, I'm assuming this is probably due to the FPU performance gain. It just wasn't enough to outperform the AM5 x86. And without enabling the extra features, it's even outperformed by the lowly DX4. Again, this was pretty surprising to me given its good synthetic scores. And finally, is the extra clock speed enough to best the pod in Quake? Well, not quite, but the 160MHz AM5 x86 really isn't all that far behind with a very impressive 17 frames per second. Just unheard of for 486. And the 120MHz Cyrix chip with its features enabled does a bit better here with 16.2 frames per second. Although it may still be choppy, an overclock like this really could make a noticeable difference with your experience in this game. Alright, so what's the verdict here? I wish I could say there was a clear winner, but it's not quite so simple. Each of these chips definitely has their pros and cons, but let's go through each one before we draw any conclusions here. So I think the best thing about the coveted Pentium Overdrive, aside from its unmatched FPU performance, is that it's a really well-rounded performer across all the benchmarks. May not have topped every chart, but it was pretty close in most cases. But the elephant in the room was its price and availability. You just can't ignore the fact that it was priced more than three times what the AM5 x86 was. And that was really if you could find it at its MSRP, which doesn't sound like it was easy to do. So if you were to consider a pod back then, you'd have to seriously pause and decide whether it was worth sinking that much money into, you know, essentially a dead platform. I'm sure there were a lot of people out there that weighed the pros and cons and ended up putting that money towards a proper Pentium system instead. On the flip side though, I still think it's a very unique feat of engineering for such a dated platform and really can provide next generation levels of performance in some situations. I think it's just too bad it was so expensive, hard to get, and that it didn't hit the market sooner than it did. Next let's talk about the AM5X86. So even though it really is just a 486, with its really high 133 MHz clock speed and 16K of right back L1, does it really need all those newfangled next generation enhancements? This chip was just plain fast. And with its well-known overclocking headroom on tap, this fast chip can be even faster for those not afraid to push it a little. And unlike the Pentium Overdrive, the AM5X86 was cheap and easy to find. And when it comes to drop-in upgrades, there were numerous third parties providing upgrade chips for older 5 volt only boards. And they were, you know, the usual 168 pin chips too that didn't need socket 3 and its 237 pins to be supported. And really, unless you're trying to play Quake or need a really fast FPU for some other purpose, the AM5X86 is actually a really great choice, especially when it comes to gaming. So where to begin with the Cyrix 5X86? Despite doing really well in synthetic benchmarks, especially with its great memory and cache performance, I'm surprised it didn't do better to be honest. When it came to 3D benchmarks and gaming especially, it lagged behind a fair bit and it was sometimes even outperformed by the DX4100. It really is unfortunate that Cyrix disabled some very beneficial features on the chip because they can provide a pretty big boost in performance in some situations. But I think the chip really needs a higher clock speed to shine. The overclocked results looked a lot better and I think buying the 120MHz model of this chip was definitely the way to go back in 95. But the really important thing to remember about the Cyrix 5X86 is that it was released in June of 1995, really months before the 83MHz pod and the AM5X86. And without those two chips on the scene, I have no doubt that in June this was by far the fastest chip available for the 486 platforms and a very unique and exciting prospect for those looking to upgrade. But sadly, that advantage was pretty short-lived. I think if the expensive pod was really the only competition, it would still be a pretty compelling option. But with the cheap AM5X86, it really made that more of a difficult choice, that's for sure. But for me personally, I think that the AM5X86 was the way to go. It was cheap, easy to get, and it could really provide a big performance boost. I just don't think it made a whole lot of sense investing so much money into a pod when that money could be better put towards a proper Pentium setup instead. So, all that said, if you had an aging 486 back in December of 1995, which of these three chips would you choose? Or would you choose none of them and put that money towards a proper Pentium instead? Let me know in the comments, I'd love to hear your perspective on it. So that's it for today, I hope you enjoyed this video, and please don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more retro PC content like this. Also, don't forget to check the description for more information, and for links to my blog, and for finding me on Twitter as well. Thanks again for watching.